song of the really song of reflection. It is 291. 291. When we were at the coercion and conscience seminar, a pastor, a old physician, prayed this song as his prayer. And it is, Sorry. I believe, present truth. And as we acknowledge this song and the truth of the song, I believe God will get us to the place where we'll actually be able to experience the latter rain. 291. 291. We have not known thee as we ought.
we are going to hear from Ron in the last portion of this day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this song just captures the, the truth of where we are. I have not known you as you ought to be known, nor loved you, nor shared you, nor followed you, nor feared you. Oh, Father, I pray that you will accomplish those goals in us even before we leave here tonight. Thank you for using Ron. May you pour your Holy Spirit out on him and on us. And may we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Go ahead, reposition your mic. <coughs> Are we going to use your? Yeah. Okay. Anyways, whatever you've heard about corporate repentance, uh, good or bad, um, I do think there is a biblical principle that God is calling us to recognize the sins of the Father and Amen. our fathers. In fact, I did a three-part series this last summer. The first two from Scripture and the last one from events in uh, our history. And so I do think it's an important period. Uh, an important subject for us to talk about. But I'm not going to do it from a theological standpoint. I'm going to do it by telling a story. And some of you who have, uh, you know, heard me talk, have heard, you, heard me talk about John F. Baylor's story. I never heard of John F. Baylor until uh, probably five or six years ago when I happened to be uh, looking for something else. And this story came out of the review, and Raymond and I used to talk about this for hours, you know, uh, and hopefully someday it will end up in print. But anyways, John F. Baylor, he was born in uh, 1840 in Switzerland, and at the age of four, his and he and three other uh, siblings and his parents moved to New York, 1844. They were Methodists, at least in name, and uh, they moved to New York. His uh, mother died when he was 12 years old. And like, you know, probably other people, immigrants especially, they didn't have money. 
the father didn't have money to uh, pay for the kids and, and obviously to take care of them. And so he, you know, gave them out to other families that would be able to take care of them and obviously uh, that they could help out. John uh, moved in with a family and uh, began to work at a, a convection or a confectioner's uh, factory, which is a place that makes candy and so forth. And I don't know what particular job he had, something, something probably in an assembly line making candy, but at some point during that time, uh, when he got to the age of 18, he was also uh, serving drinks at a bar and uh, working at, as a candy maker. And at some point, he developed an infection in one of his eyes. And of course, in the days before he was aware of it, even you know hydrotherapy or something like that, or uh, you know some kind of an antibiotic or something to take care of this infection, it obviously continued to fester, and uh, he to the point where he lost uh, eyesight in that one eye, and. Uh, then it wasn't too much long after that, that that infection moved from one eye to the other, mm -hmm. and he was totally blind. And this is him actually writing. He says, uh, the intense suffering which followed for two long months. At the end of this time, I was unable to open my eyes when the painful knowledge came to me that I was blind. My father employed one oculist, or eye doctor, after another in vain hopes of restoring my sight until destitution stared us in the face. So they would go from doctor to doctor trying to find, you know, something to remedy this infection in his eyes. In the operations thus performed upon my eyes, I suffered much. At one time I had so far recovered sight as to be able to distinguish colors. So whatever film or, or blurriness uh, had come over the eye, he, he could still see colors there. But the oculist, in attempting to remove the film that gathered over the eyes, cut directly into the pupil and thus destroyed the sight. Now you can imagine what happens when you scrape over infection and then s sever in, into the skin. It takes that infection right into the eye, you know, ball itself. It's not just a surface infection. And in desperation because of the pain, they finally removed his entire eyeball from each socket. If you can imagine that in the days before real good anesthesia. And this is what John writes. He says, in the first wild anguish of my life, when realizing for the first time that darkness was my doom, that there was no more bright sunshine, sunshine for my poor eyes, I sought God's help upon my bended knees for the first time in my life. 18, Methodist, but never sought God. And my t petition, as you can only imagine, 18 year old or any age, was foresight, for his sight. Physical sight, notice, I did not obtain but the eyes of my mind became enlightened in a measure so that I saw myself an offender before God. Lost without Christ, I realized my condition so forcibly that in guilt and shame I fell from my kneeling posture to the floor. And this is how John F. Baylor tells his basically conversion story. He was praying for physical sight and the Lord touched his heart through this experience and he realized his need of Christ for the first time in his life. Well, he went to a school for the blind in Wisconsin and uh, <clears throat> there, of course, he learned how to live uh, being blind. Uh, and they would, you know, he was you know, a young, young person, still 18. And uh, for several years he was there, they would go out you know, behind the school there, there was a river and they would go swimming out there. And he tells about how one time he almost drowned because he couldn't figure out which direction to go to the shore um, and almost drowned. But the Lord uh, saved him from that experience. 
uh, when he, he wore glass eye, you know, like a, a fake eye, he would put those in the sockets, but they were, it was so uncomfortable that after a while, he actually started just wearing, you know, dark uh, glasses to cover those gaping holes in his head. And uh, he got married um, when he was 20 years old, 24 years old, sorry. Uh, he had a, a son, and it was sometime during this time that he actually uh, began to study with First-day Adventists, not Seventh-day Adventists, but First-day Adventists. And so he left the Methodist Church, and then shortly after that, he ran into uh, Jan Andrews, and I don't know how that happened, but uh, Jan Andrews' wife, Jan Andrews is one of the early missionaries, and Jan Andrews wrote some books, uh, Ricky, we, we probably have some in, in the, uh, the collection, and Jan Andrews' wife read those books to John F. Baylor, and John F. Baylor became a Seventh-day Adventist. His first wife died, and a year or so later, he married uh, Mary J. Bauer, became his second wife, and he wrote down uh, his story, wrote it in a book, and they somehow got it printed off, and he began to go door to door and <coughs> sell brooms and other things like that. <coughs> Thanks, that dear lady, for the water. <laughs> And uh, they began to sell his book, too, uh, door to door. So he was, uh, I don't know that if he was an official canvasser yet, but he was selling his book, and his wife put some recipes in it, in the back, and some uh, natural remedies and so forth, and then he told his story in the book, and he would sell, you know, brooms and, and other things door to door, and, uh, and, uh, and his book. Well, in those days, they didn't have seeing eye dogs, but they you could hire like a seeing eye lad or a, some you know young person that would uh, be your eyes for you. And he tells stories about how he would you know uh, get in himself into trouble uh, with these seeing eye lads. Um, one of those stories was they would he would get on a train on one side of town, you know, and, and in order not to have to walk all the way across town, he would get onto the train and then. When they would get to the other side of the town, you know, the, his uh, lad that was guiding him would, would jump and then tell John, you know, go ahead, jump now. Well, the, he did that one time, and the lad jumped and telling John, you know, jump now, and, and John delayed just a little bit, not realizing that the train had gone over a trestle. And John F. Baylor jumped, and he went down over 20 feet, and he missed hitting every, all the cross beams and everything and landed on the ground. And although he was injured, he wasn't, he wasn't killed from the experience. The, the people that, you know, obviously scooped him up could not understand how he had fallen through the trestle without hitting anything. Well, he uh, actually was, did well with his door-to-door -door work, he actually made, this is in $1870, he made over $200 a month just selling his book alone. But John F. Baylor was very generous, and when James White wrote in the review calling for donations for the Missionary Tract Society, the first one built, which was in uh, Massachusetts, they built that building, that building was was uh, put up primarily from the funds of John F. B. Uh, and what had happened, actually part of that, was he sold his house and gave a lot of the proceeds to uh, build that track society and start that work, 1870. Well, he moved to Texas, uh, uh, to Dallas, actually. That's an early picture of it, or early drawing of it. and. Uh, while he was there, there uh, some jealousy came up in the church because of you know his success and uh, R. M. Kilgore, who is an interesting name because he was involved in the 1888 controversy as well. Anyways, he took John F. Baylor to task, put on a church trial, and <coughs> condemned John F. Baylor. He condemned him for 
evidently whatever rift there had gone on in the church. Well, Ellen White had a dream about that, and she wrote to uh, Kilgore and let him know uh, that he was wrong, absolutely wrong, and doubly so because he was dealing with a blind man. Really? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't have the reference here, but you can read it in, in uh, one of the testimonies. Uh, then in 1878, both James and uh, Ellen White, uh, John F. Baylor moved, um, or actually built a home there in uh, Denison, just north of Dallas. I don't know if I'm saying that name right, Denison, okay. And he built a home there, and it was large enough, two-story, had extra rooms in it. James and Ellen White came down, and they spent um, six months living with John F. Baylor. And uh, that's where uh, Ellen White met A.G. Daniels and her secretary, Mary Davis, who also were living with John F. Baylor at the time. And James, being uh, having history in publishing, saw the uh, book that John F. Baylor had, and it was obviously very <coughs> simply done. And I wouldn't even say it's in exchange, but as a thank you to John F. Baylor for, for allowing them to, James and Ellen, to live there with him, James uh, reformatted his book and sent it off to Battle Creek to have it uh, printed and published in a, a much nicer form. And this is actually a copy of, that would have been in the, in the early 80s before James died. This is actually a picture of an 1888 edition of John F. Baylor's book. And by the way, you can actually order a copy on Amazon that tells us some of his story. Now, unfortunately, it only covers his story up to, you know, probably the, the late 70s uh, or mid 80s. But again, John F. Baylor then began to uh, co porter, I mean, officially with his wife, and he would sell his book and other Adventist books uh, going uh, door to door. And again, he would generously support the church. Now, in 1888, the same time that his book was reprinted again, the uh, Great Controversy was also reprinted. It was Spirit of Prophecy Volume 4 before that, but Ellen White, having just come from Europe, or been while she was in Europe, and being in the very area where the Reformation started, she added another hundred pages to Spirit of Prophecy Volume 4, which was the early edition of Great Controversy, and added a few paragraphs here and there throughout the book, and then it was reprinted in 1888, and that's basically what we have in the 1911 edition as well. And in the 1888 edition, uh, Ellen White adds, in one of the last chapters about the message going to the world, she adds a couple of paragraphs that were not in the 84 edition. And then I'm going to read uh, this here. I'm talking about the latter. She says, The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its beginning, or its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Servants of God, with their face lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, a warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Amen. And I don't have proof that John F. Baylor uh, read the Great Controversy or had it read to him, but I assume so because he sold the book. And I wonder if it was reading this paragraph or these paragraphs that got him thinking. I don't know for sure, but something got him thinking. I also am not for certain, I don't know if he attended the 1888 General Conference, but it's possible he did, 
because in the this you know well-known picture on the left bottom hand corner you see a man with dark glasses on and I, it's very similar to Very similar to other, another picture that I believe is John F. Baylor when he was at Pacific Press. So I don't know which which it was that got John F. Baylor thinking. It may have been both. He may have read Great Controversy and then been there in 1888. But something got him thinking. And when he attended a Bible school with his family in 1891, this is what uh, Otho... God's Mark wrote about John F. Baylor. He says, in the early spring of 1891, while connected with the Los Angeles, California Bible School, <coughs> Baylor and family spent several weeks with us, during which time his blindness was often a subject of conversation. And being interested in the study of medicine, I paid special attention to the condition of the stumps, which was all that was left in the sockets from which the entire eyeball of each eye had been removed. And then Brother Gosmar goes on. Brother Baylor stated at that time, 1891, that it was his belief if he remained faithful to the end that during the special outpouring of the latter rain, his eyes would be restored. And he cited John 9, 3 as evidence that God is able to do that. It's made me really look at John chapter 9, the story of the blind man, differently than I looked at this before. The blind man in John 9 is different than some of the other blind men, I believe in the Bible, who this man was born blind, and I wonder if he was born without eye eyeballs. Right. Because when he was healed, they didn't recognize him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's why John Baylor cites that as evidence to him that God can do that kind of thing. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now this morning I read uh, Ellen White's letter April 6, 1892 or couple paragraphs from it. It's the first time that I found where she actually, in, in a letter, says that light of Revelation 18.1, the loud cry, is, is now. It's beginning. It's begun. Six times in that single letter, she says, uses the word now. And then, of course, uh, Haskell wrote articles based on that that summer. On April 10, Four days later, Ellen White's in Australia. In California, April 10, 1892, there was a camp meeting going on. Some of the, you know, one of the camp meetings that I, I read about earlier this afternoon, where revivals were taking place. And at that camp meeting, um, the, April 10 was the final night. And when those meetings were over, a lot of the people came back, some stayed in tents, some came back to town and spent time in the, in the hotels. You know, they stayed in the, in the hotel or motel in town. And it was evening time, and several families, you know, in rooms next to each other, as it began to get dark, they lit their lanterns. And as it is today, you know, you can rent uh, hotel rooms where there's a door in between two rooms, you know, so if you're staying with a group, you can open those doors and talk to one another. Well, there was a door in between two rooms, and they opened the door, and on the other side of that door, John F. Baylor was sitting in a chair. And I'll let you, I'll let him tell you what happened. Brother Frank Thorpe 
my wife and daughter and myself were talking on the subject of healing. In answer to prayer, when suddenly the light of the lamp made such an impression as to cause me to exclaim, what is that? It was the lamp 16 feet away. It was in the adjoining room, and the door between the rooms had been opened. For some months previous, I had been.